Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, whom curiosity has brought to this uh, meeting about uh, unidentified flying objects. Is that the correct expression? Now it is unidentified aerial phenomena. That's the uh, Pentagon definition as of 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, but uh, in IAC we use plain English. <laughs> now the questions are, um, you know, does it mean that there is extra galactic or extraterrestrial intelligence? Question number one. And uh, question number two is, uh, they say that the Pentagon knows so much about it, but why are they being so secretive? Now, to take us on this, you know, astral ride, we have uh, with us uh, Comte Carpentier de Gourdon, who is, um, what shall I say, you know, he's a Renaissance man. Renaissance is a French word, and you are as much French as Indian, correct? How long have you been in India now? Overall, it must be, uh, well, something like almost 27 years. Okay, you should... Only one stretch. Yeah, you, you should stand for election. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I do these uh, mock interviews for the civil service, so I tell them uh, to read World Affairs Journal. And uh, our friend is the convener of the editorial board. And he's also, he does so many things, so many hats. Uh, he's a consultant to International Institute for Society, uh, Social and Economic Studies, Vienna. And he has written books. Um, um, well, I won't list all of them. Um, from India to Infinity and uh, Memories of a Hundred and One Moons and so on. A strong city on a hill. Shining city on a hill. Shining city on a hill. Yeah, I wrote it in hurry. <laughs> and Novus Ordo Seculorum. So, let us sort of listen to our good friend and uh, as I said, tighten your belt. Good evening. Good evening. Can you no. Yes. Yeah. And uh, thank you to Ambassador Fabian and to the audience and to India International Center for having made possible this talk which uh, is on a subject that is regarded as very unusual, although it shouldn't be, and I will say why. And uh, yet it uh, evokes a lot of uh, difficulties, questions, doubts, sometimes a lot of opposition. So I will really stay with what is the most uh, indisputable evidence and all the facts that are confirmed and recognized. I will not go uh, in general on speculative or uh, contestable assertions, although inevitably there is always a part of what you might call circumstantial evidence which may not be uh, uh, hard core evidence as we understand it. But then evidence in itself is a, an elusive standard, as I will demonstrate. So anyway, this will be uh, a very, uh, I would say, conservative presentation in some way, although you can hardly be conservative on this topic. And uh, many people think this is just a strange or weird topic, or it's something which is interesting for uh, either scientists or for eccentrics. But actually, we will see that there is a lot more to it, apart from hard science and technology. There is a lot more to it, including, of course, in terms of sociology, in terms of uh, political science, in terms of the culture, of the economy, of the future of mankind and of our very vision of the universe and of ourselves. So first I will say very briefly where we are uh, in terms of this topic. As you know, on, uh, after a fairly lengthy process of uh, several years of discussions at the highest level, on 26 July last, a hearing took place on Capitol Hill uh, of a number of witnesses coming from the military and from the intelligence community in the United States 
to, uh, for Congress people, Congress members, to understand what exactly they knew and what exactly the U.S. government, especially the military and the intelligence community, had been hiding from Congress, which is, in fact, in many ways illegal uh, in certain regards, specific regards. So Congress was vitally interested in knowing what had been hidden from them. If you go back and you remember the Church Commission in the CIA uh, activities back in the 70s and a number of other, I mean, Watergate, can quite, quite a few of those, but I have called this talk the cosmic uh, the WikiLeaks because uh, you see a parallel with what happened uh, in the case of uh, Julian Assange, and you know what happened to him, he's still in jail and they probably will never let him go, even though what has come out from uh, WikiLeaks, as much as it is and as important as it is, is you will see rather inconsequential in comparison to what has come out now from the UFO file. So that's a brief preamble. Then I will say that uh, uh, basically in the last six years, there has been a, a, a sort of sea change in the UFO situation because uh, everything began with an article in the New York Times which in 2017, which reported on a very secretive uh, project uh, organized and uh, launched by the, chairman, the majority leader in the Senate uh, Senator Harry Reid from Nevada, and Senator Harry Reid, who is from Nevada, uh, could not ignore the fact that about 60 miles from, I think it's 60 miles from Las Vegas, there is uh, Area 61, you know, with all that it comprises, the Nevada test site, Groom Lake, uh, uh, and all the other different facilities which are there. I mean, it's a little country in, uh, by size. I think it's the size of Rhode Island, where access is severely restricted. And there is a particular airline from Las Vegas called Janet Airlines, which is a CIA airline, which has the exclusive right to fly back and forth from Area 51. Now, after saying this, so what I would like to say very briefly, because I have 45 minutes, and if I have to say everything that needs to be said, we would be here in a week. But uh, I would simply say that uh, this particular project, which was called uh, essentially a research into uh, the secret phenomena that could not be explained, or at least that were not known or acknowledged by the government, this was conducted by a group of scientists and CIA people, including somebody called Lu Luis Elizondo. And it was funded uh, partly by uh, Congress, uh, they, I think they sanctioned $22 million, and partly by a very uh, uh, eccentric billionaire called uh, Bigelow, who uh, owns a number of uh, holiday inns all over the country and who was fascinated by UFOs to the point that he created his own task force, and he found that uh, there was actually, he could actually uh, have interactions that were not necessarily of the most peaceful kind with certain creatures, and it came to a point where he said he had lost two men, two of his men, in uh, encounters with uh, aliens. So anyway, this was all kept secret until in 2017, somehow it was leaked to the New York Times. And once the New York Times uh, began to write about it, then it arose a great deal of interest. Uh, there were two uh, senior journalists, Ralph Blumenthal and uh, uh, Leslie Keane, who had already been documenting UFO cases. And people then realized that what so many high-level journalists, writers, politicians, astronauts had been saying for years had a basis in truth, because photographs and scenes were put online, and they were taken from US aircraft. I'm talking about uh, fighters. And the pilots uh, tried to catch we, uh, you know, UFOs that were playing with them. And uh, for UFO had become such a discredited term that they called them UAPs, as we know, which has become the official parlance, because the Air Force and the Navy and uh, all the other agencies had sworn that they were no longer interested in UFOs and they would not study them because it was a waste of time. That was back in the 70s. But yet they continue to study them, but they just give them another name, which is a very fa uh, familiar trick that they use in the intelligence community. So then uh, this uh, arose, I mean, it created a certain a wave of interest, but then it, uh, I would say, went down until 
just last year, two years ago, when the wave of, uh, you might say, questions uh, rose again, and a number of Congress people uh, started, including senators and very powerful senators, began to say from the intelligence community, began to say, we cannot let this go on forever. We need to know what's going on. And uh, at that point, the intelligence community did what they usually do. They invited a few select members of Congress to a closed door uh, hearing, where they actually showed them uh, films which were uh, stunning, according to the report of some of the witnesses, because they showed that they had filmed at very close quarters, not only craft, but beings. And yet they were not allowed to say what they had seen. So the final, you might say, the, the straw that perhaps broke the camel's back was the testimony of a man called David Grosch just about uh, two, two months ago. Uh, David Grosch is a very high clearance intelligence officer who actually uh, had the necessary ranking to deliver the morning intelligence briefing to the US president in the Oval Office. And therefore, his credibility is, I would say, very high. And David Grosch, first privately went to the Inspector General of Intelligence and told him, listen, I have evidence that uh, at least 40 people I have talked to in the intelligence community have interacted with aliens and uh, they know about craft because they have not only seen them but worked on them. So the Inspector General of the intelligence community uh, said that this was a highly credible testimony and that it had to be investigated. However, nothing happened because Predictably, the Pentagon and others stepped in and said, please keep that quiet. So Brush finally went public, and he gave a, a TV interview to, a, to an Australian journalist and to a lot of other networks, especially the smaller networks, which are now very important in America, because they are taking over from the dinosaurs, you know, NBC, uh, CNN, and uh, ABC. And in particular, uh, there are two or three of these relatively small networks, which now have millions of uh, watchers, and they reported on David Grosch, and he was interviewed, and he said, I absolutely have evidence that uh, we have not only craft that have been captured or given to us, and which come from another planet or civilization, but we also have bodies, and we, have in we interact with uh, living beings who are not human. So at that point, he was also one of the witnesses uh, in the con congressional hearing just uh, 26th of July, and his testimony was also extremely convincing. Naturally, now you see the U.S. is uh, in a very difficult situation because there are still officials, including the head of uh, the so-called investigation agency for UFOs in the Pentagon, who has come out saying, this is insulting, how could we have kept such a secret? We don't do such things, and we feel very sorry that this information is coming out because it's not true, we never know, we never knew about alien intelligence, we are looking for it, and we think that maybe one day we will find it, but we haven't found it. They have been saying that for 70 years. So clearly, uh, the lie at the highest level is exposed. And, uh, but again, I would like to say that this is not an American story, that many people think, because it's all over the world. And I have pretty good testimonies from Indian military officers about the very frequent UFO sightings in the Himalayas, in particular between China and India, on the Aksai Chin and on the Siachen area. They have been photographed, they have been documented, and with my late friend uh, Ashok Parthasarathy, the son of uh, Jay Parthasarathy, we even wrote a report for, on, on it to the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, suggesting that he take up the investigation because we knew that the Americans and the Russians had done a lot and the Chinese were doing a lot. So we felt it was time for India to get involved. However, the Prime Minister checked with some of the scientists who obviously were, I think, are very conservative, and they said, you know, you should probably not touch this because it's a very tricky subject, and you might get in trouble with the Americans, you, you, you have the nuclear deal, they might start saying that you are not playing ball, and therefore let it be. And I remember the memorable statement by a scientist I will not name, who said, well, you know, maybe what the pilots saw when they saw UFOs was planet Venus, because there are times when planet Venus uh, looks very big and you can actually take it for what it is not. And yet I had pilots telling me personally that they had actually flown over these UFOs because the UFO was flying under them. 
now when you are saying that uh, and they were playing games which they like to do they they just basically in, indulge in dog fights and clearly what's very striking about it is that uh, they seem to know ahead of time what the pilot is going to do and this has been explained by the likelihood that they are actually entering the mental field of the pilot just as they can enter the mental field of anyone they're interested in and so they are aware of what the next action is going to be. So when you say there are vehicles flying, you don't just think they are planes that uh, you know could be made by us because actually many reported instances which have been documented and recorded and which are completely acknowledged at the official level are that some of these craft have been seen flying at uh, more than 80,000 miles an hour and uh, in a particular set of cases off the coast of California near the Santa Catalina Islands, the pilots recorded on their instruments, not only the pilots but the ships that were at sea at that time, that some of those craft could go in about one tenth of a second from 100 miles an hour to 18,000 miles an hour and they would take uh, U-turns and right degree, right angle turns at 25,000 miles an hour, which means that there was no way a plane could cope keep up with them and they could essentially uh, take the plane wherever they wanted to. And if they wanted to, they could practically take control of the plane's uh, you know, equipment. Now, this is just to give you a little background as to where we are now. But of course, the historical background is much larger. But before I go there, I will also say very briefly uh, what is my own background in it. I happen to have known about it when I was a child because early on I was, like many children, fascinated by the known and especially by the stories of UFOs that you sometimes saw in magazines. And then my father said, you know, when I was a young journalist in Paris, we were taken by the Ministry of uh, Communication Information once to a, an auditorium where we were told that, uh, you know, there are some beings that obviously are not from here and they fly and in and out and we should just be aware of it the americans are the ones who are leading the investigation on the western side uh, but you please don't report on it seriously because uh, it would scare people and we have strategic interest in keeping people unaware of that so if you have to report it make it look like a fun story but then try to in the end deny it and, and of course that's a very classic cia it's not only the CIA technique that you will report a story and then you'll start saying, but you know, the person who told me this actually had a grandmother who went mad and then he had very big problems in his childhood. So right away you infer that there is something wrong with the whole thing and then you make a joke and most people go home thinking, well, who knows, you know, this seems to be another person who probably had some uh, drug or, you know, drank too much. So they have kept that game for a very long time and that gave them an opportunity to do a lot of research and to uh, keep most of the public unaware. Now, so I said that when I was a child I got this first testimony and then of course there were many other uh, things that I came to know and when I lived in the US, in fact one of my books is about that, how within a few months of going to the US I began to talk to military people who told me yeah, we have a very big program going on. It's higher classification than uh, the Manhattan Project, and it's all about alien technology. And we are competing with the Russians, and not, not yet with the Chinese at that time. I'm talking about the 80s. Uh, but the Russians were very much into it. So were the British, so were the Israelis, and so were the French, and so were a few other countries. And uh, interestingly enough, the retired head of the uh, Israeli defense Space Defense Agency, General Haim Eshed, two years ago published a book in Hebrew, but then he was interviewed by Jerusalem Post in English, and in that book and in that article he said, listen, I have headed the Israeli Space Agency for 30 years, I actually built it up, I launched the first, you know, OPEC satellite, and I can tell you that there is a big program going on with certain alien races, and they have helped us, they have taken us to Mars, where they have an underground base, so we have humans working there with them, just as we have humans working with them on the moon and on Earth. And he said, the reason I can say that is that I'm 87 years old, I have nothing to lose, I'm retired. And uh, Donald Trump would have said it before me. He said it in 2020, and Donald Trump was president then. And Donald Trump was about to say it, and then he was told, 
don't say it because you are in enough trouble and uh, if you say that you're going to get into much bigger trouble. But it's interesting that every US president and practically every UN Secretary General has been trying to know about UFOs or knew about them and uh, couldn't speak. And the people who said they couldn't learn what was happening because they were told this is beyond your pay grade include uh, Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Nixon, Johnson didn't talk about it that I know of, but then you get into uh, Reagan, who was pretty uh, talkative about it, Carter before Reagan, and then you have George Bush, who was head of CIA, wouldn't speak anyway, and refused to answer Clinton when Clinton tried to investigate. And you get to the last president, of course, we don't know what Biden thinks and if he even thinks, but uh, the fact is that uh, his predecessor, Obama, has also come out on television saying we are dealing with uh, technology that we cannot understand and which is so far beyond us that we cannot uh, really uh, duplicate it. So this is a pretty well established uh, situation. And uh, what is extraordinary is that most people still think that it is uh, either a fantasy or it is something which is uh, so bizarre that nobody can make sense of it. Uh, in fact, a lot of our technologies that have been commercialized in the last 30 years, and quite a few more that have not been commercialized because they remain in the domain of the military, are what they call extraterrestrial or alien uh, reversed technology, reverse engineering. So essentially, you try to develop something out of what you have, and there are labs which are dedicated in Russia, it is Kapustin Yar, and in America it's been several places actually. It's, you know, there is a whole principle of need to know, which means the technology is divided into many different sections and departments so that nobody knows what the others are doing, so that nobody is able to rebuild the whole story by himself. So essentially there are teams that are working uh, in isolation. But then what is also very interesting is that according to various U.S. presidents, at least in the U.S., a lot of that is now beyond the control of government because uh, it has been taken over by uh, some of the very powerful military industrial corporations that uh, practically make or break U.S. policy because they are the ones who dictate the war since they need to sell weapons. Of course, you know which ones I'm referring to. Raytheon, which absorbed the huge aerospace, then you have, uh, you know, you Northrop Grumman, and you have at least uh, 10 of those which are essentially controlling the largest budget in the world because the U.S. spends almost $800 billion officially on defense, but it also spends $200 billion on the Department of Energy, and nobody knows what they are doing, uh, and they spend so much more money in other departments. Um, there have been very authoritative calculations done by American academics headed by uh, my friend uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, who was uh, undersecretary of uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And she was able to conclude that over the last 25 years, 20 trillion or more have disappeared from the US accounts, in the sense that the US has officially lost more than 20 trillion dollars, which is seven times uh, India's GDP. And this has been done through a series of very ingenious processes which consist in overbilling and in assigning false um, reasons, saying I we have done it for this reason and then the money goes in somewhere else. Of course, a lot of it is just plain corruption. But, uh, I mean, this is an old problem. During World War II, there was so much corruption uh, in the military, especially in the U.S. military, that uh, Truman came in saying, I have to clean the OGM stables. And then, of course, he didn't clean it because it's too powerful to be cleaned. But the fact is that this corruption has been expanding and expanding, and it not only leads to unnecessary wars, as we see continuously, but it also leads to uh, a lot of secret research, some of which is obviously very valuable, except it's not being used for the public good, most of it. It is being used for military cover programs. So with this brief introduction, I will proceed to show a few slides which... Right. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are just, you know, I could have shown hundreds of slides, including of uh, some aliens, but I've decided not to 
because there can always be a controversy as to whether it is true. You never have 100% proof, although you have pretty strong uh, you know, evidence. But uh, the fact is that uh, it's better to keep it as conservative as possible. And anyway, there are so many different alien shapes, probably shape-shifting also, that uh, you can't really get people stuck with one particular image of the alien. Of course, there are very common aliens who are the greys, you know, who are actually biological organisms that have been created uh, probably in a lab. They are not born. They are essentially organisms like biorobots, and they have a given lifespan, and then they disappear. And they are seen fairly frequently for the last 70 years. I mean, it seems like the Roswell crash was actually about uh, these aliens. I mean, they are the ones who somehow crashed near uh, in Roswell. So what's happening here? Okay, I think the aliens are already yeah, protesting. Yeah, That's it, I think. So this is one of the photographs which has very unimpeachable source. It shows you that it's not just uh, the average, uh, you know. What do we do without the light? Huh? Yeah, uh, if, if you can switch up some of the light in the back, but you don't want to be in complete darkness. Yeah, yeah all right. So that will... Um, uh, you know, this, this is one of the videos which shows that the photographs, which, and it's also a video that shows that the craft can be of extremely complex shapes. We have seen squares within cubes, I mean, sorry, cubes within uh, spheres, and other sorts of things, and of course, very long cigars, some of which can be several hundred meters long, and uh, all sorts of uh, vehicles. And what's very interesting is that it's not a matter of just photographs or uh, not a matter of their speed, but also a lot of observations have been made about their propulsion system. As most of you know who have read any of the recent reports from the US uh, sources, uh, these craft create their own electromagnetic and gravitational field. So they are completely immune to uh, essentially the effects of gravity, which is how they can move at such speeds. And they create a shield of extremely cold air to uh, essentially protect the surroundings from the heat that they generate from their engines because they are essentially in a bubble of about four or 5,000 degrees Celsius. And then they surround that with a uh, shell which can be about 120 degrees below zero. So as a result, uh, imagine if that shield were to somehow dissipate, then the UFO would practically sear the entire area miles away because of the extraordinarily hot temperatures that they generate in the atmosphere. Of course, in space, it's another matter. Now, why does this disappear? I think so. Right, yeah, that's what I've done. Okay. So we have seen a lot of very strange phenomena like, phenomena like uh, these balls that are falling in various parts of the world. This was in Spain. And nobody understands what they are for because even when they fall, they seem to have a mind of their own. They move around, and it's almost in, they're almost indestructible. I mean, they are completely without any kind of seams. Uh, there is no welding or anything. They are made in one, uh, and it's pure, uh, actually, iron. It's not steel, it's iron, but then it's iron that doesn't rust. And uh, if you don't tie them somewhere, they keep rolling on the ground sometimes, and then they stop, and then they roll again, even on a flat surface. So it's something that's very bizarre, but which is part of what is being investigated by a number of uh, scientists. And then there are people who have them in their private homes and who, of course, refuse to tell where they are because they don't want the government to come and ask them for those fears. You know, it's a very strange thing. But the other thing which is strange about these fears is that they seem to tell us, and there are some very interesting investigations done about this, that they are like observational uh, modules and they are there to uh, watch the atmosphere and probably keep some other people away because it seems increasingly evident that we are not dealing with a unified uh, presence. There are different factions and they don't necessarily agree with each other. So uh, some of them apparently are already here. They are keeping the peace to a point and they are shooting down or chasing away those they do not want to see coming in. So there is a sort of a space war going on, and it appears from a number of testimonies that uh, certain governments at least have been made aware of this at a certain level, and they have been told, we are, what, we are with you in the sense we are not going to hurt you or harm you, but 
we are keeping watch on others who might not be so benevolent. Now, the question is, would you trust them? Well, first, you don't have much of a choice. And two, uh, it seems that they haven't really grossly interfered in human affairs, except for a number of abductions uh, and other phenomena, which I will talk about. But it all seems to be scientific. And in fact, what uh, Professor uh, General uh, Heine Shed in Israel said in his testimony and in his book is that actually they made an agreement with some governments to conduct experiments on Earth. And they said in exchange for that, we'll let you have access to some of our technologies and we will take you to some of our lives outside uh, the Earth. Uh, so there will be an exchange of knowledge. But what's uh, a little more disturbing, however, is that um, they clearly are conducting genetic experiments and they are conducting genetic hybridization in the sense that they are creating hybrid human alien beings. Is that for their own end? Is that for improving our own uh, biologic, our own uh, stock? That is something which probably is known by some, but uh, they won't say, and probably very few people know for sure anyway. So now, uh, does this not go any further? Let me see. Maybe I'm going to. OK. This is uh, Professor Gary Nolan from the University of Stanford. I am in touch with him. He is one of the leading immunologists in the world. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Stanford Research Institute had started the investigations on UFOs back in the 70s. A friend of mine was asked uh, to head that task force. And then it was stopped by the Pentagon that stepped in and said, no, there is no investigation of UFOs. There are no UFOs, so please stop. Uh, and uh, however, there obviously has remained an interest. And if you remember, it's from Stanford that the initial project for in the internet began. So Gary Nolan is a, a very open-minded scientist. I'm always reminded of what Charles Kettering said. You know, people are very open to new things as long as they are exactly like the old things. Uh, but he's different. And he realized very soon that there were phenomena that could not be explained uh, by uh, what you might call existing knowledge. And then he was entrusted by the CIA with certain technological uh, elements and also with some biological samples. And he analyzed them and found that they were not from this planet and that they clearly carried a different uh, genetic signature. Uh, so that he's very open about. He has been lecturing about it. He has been answering questions. He has been saying there is absolute evidence that there are aliens visiting us and that they seem to have interacted with us for a very long time. And in fact, if you look at the literature in the Middle Age, in the 18th century, in almost any era, in any period, in any part of the world, you will find there are references to certain craft that came down and certain beings that came out or didn't come out, but at least gave some sign of their presence. So it's a very, very old phenomenon. And some people are even saying that we probably are relatively newcomers and they have, they have been here much longer than we are. Now, this was uh, one of the early uh, big events that took place in 2001. It was uh, conducted and uh, convened by Dr. Stephen Greer, who is a physician who uh, decided to dedicate his life to investigating this uh, subject. By the way, he's also a yoga teacher, a meditator, and a student of Vedanta and Sanskrit. You often find a connection between those interests. Uh, people who are open to alien, the alien presence are very often also very interested in Indian philosophy. And one of them was Oppenheimer, you may have seen the film, and they don't probably mention that. I have not seen the film. But Oppenheimer was somebody who was asked with Einstein by the US government at the time to write a report on how he thought humans should interact with aliens if they uh, wanted to establish relations, and what would be a way to find a modus vivendi with them. How would they, what would be the kind of laws that would regulate interactions? So uh, this was a very big event. It had a lot of impact at the National Press Club. But you know, a few months later, 9-11 took place, and uh, the interest of the US government and of much of the world went in a different direction. So for a few years, nothing much would happen. But there were more than 40 witnesses, all from the government, who came to testify that they had been uh, exposed to UFO-related uh, phenomena. 
And one of the most alarming things for the US government is that every nuclear facility, particularly every military nuclear facility, has been visited sometimes more than once by UFOs. And generally what they do, and by the way, this happened in France, it happened in Britain, it happened in almost every country that has nuclear weapons. I don't know about the Indian chapter on this. But uh, what they often do is switch off the missiles and essentially check them out and see what is the state of preparedness, probably also to show that they can stop the launch if they want to. So it's a form of uh, warning and uh, probably an inspection as well, you know. And of course, when they do that, they do it at a distance. So imagine when you uh, read the specific instance of the Minot uh, in uh, North Dakota, where there was a missile base that was visited by a UFO, and they lifted without getting on the ground. They stayed about 60 feet above the ground. They lifted the lid, which covers the nuclear silo, and the lid weighs 20 ton. And they basically shot a beam inside the, uh, the well in which the missile sits. And uh, that missile went like a dud. You know, it just stopped working. And after a few minutes, they left. And then the missile uh, operating system was restored. So they were not wanting to disable it permanently, but they just did it for all the 20 missiles in that particular nuclear base. So I think it's a very interesting uh, object lesson for nuclear powers. Now, this is uh, here, Steven Greer, who launched that project in 2001, who did another one in 2010, and who has now come out with a very, very powerful press conference. Uh, this is the cover of the video. That press conference goes on for more than three hours. And he makes some very harsh accusations. He basically says, and he lays out the grounds because he's assisted by a battery of lawyers, he shows that hundreds of people in the US government are guilty of high treason, uh, lie under oath, um, and the creation of false evidence, also persecuting and sometimes killing people who wanted to tell the truth. So there is a huge case of corruption at the very uh, you know, top of the US government, particularly military and intelligence authorities, and all the civilians who either lost control or were essentially passive, uh, I would say, uh, well, they, they essentially went along. They knew that their careers were dependent on their silence, so they went along with the military intelligence decision that this would not be made available to the public. There would be absolutely no talk about it. And anybody who talked about it in a position of, uh, I would say, credibility would be severely punished, uh, going all the way to what we call the maximal demotion, which you know, in CIA language means getting rid of someone. So uh, this is, of course, this goes on for three hours, and he lays out all the charges which are against the US government. And in fact, a lawsuit has begun. Of course, you know how, what happens to lawsuits in the US, and uh, Trump is taking all the space. So <laughs> Uh, we don't know how long it will take for anything to happen, but definitely the legal process has begun, and it's very serious, because you are talking about uh, so many officials breaking their oath and uh, just refusing to inform Congress or to inform the judicial authorities about what they were doing. And in some cases, they were disposing of the life of their own citizens by making agreements that we don't know all about with certain creatures who obviously uh, did not go through any kind of public scrutiny. Now, this is an interesting, I'm just giving a few hints here because you cannot go on for thousands of such stories. This was a um, member of the Canadian government, talking about the Canadian government, I was in touch with the Deputy Prime Minister uh, Hellier, who passed away two, uh, one year ago. And Hellier uh, had been a member of the uh, British uh, Empire, I mean, of Commonwealth Privy Council, and he had also been the Minister of Defense of Canada, and he had got, he had become a very public spokesman about uh, aliens, because he had been briefed about what happened, and he decided he couldn't keep the silence. But much before Hellier got to know, Wilbur Smith was appointed by the Canadian government in 1950, 1954, to uh, investigate what the U.S. knew about it, because obviously the U.S. was not informing the Canadians either, so the Canadians decided to make their own uh, investigation. And he got to know a lot because he apparently uh, got to be in touch with some of the aliens and said that uh, they were communicating directly with certain chosen correspondents. 
and they were using uh, what we now understand, at that time nobody knew what it was, but now we understand uh, what they call sca scalar uh, electromagnetic uh, communication, scalar waves, which are of a very different frequency than the waves that we normally use. And uh, he said that clearly the communication was completely under their control. It was one-sided because uh, the human side was not able to initiate anything. All the initiatives came from above. So anyway, he was a very honest, credible witness. He was one of dozens of uh, very credible people who at that time wrote articles, published, wrote books, gave lectures. So this was by no means a secret thing as such, although it was a controversial topic. Uh, until 1952, I would say that there was a certain openness to the point that the US government produced various documentary films explaining what was happening with UFOs and what would happen if they decided to invade and destroy civilization. So those films are rather grim, but they are not uh, fiction. They are actually documentaries produced by the Department of, by the Pentagon. And you can find them, I have the list. I mean, not complete list, but I have a few on, on my list. However, by 1952, that's when a number of uh, UFOs floated around the Capitol and created a sort of a panic. Then the Pentagon had to give a press conference, which was probably the biggest con press conference in the Pentagon's history. And they had to explain that they didn't know what it was, and they thought it might be some temperature inversion. Of course, they tried to find some uh, you know, cockide explanation. But uh, basically, they got so scared that they decided this could no longer be uh, publicized. And then, if you believe it, but I won't uh, vouchsafe that, but there is fairly serious, uh, I would say, multiple testimony that uh, in 1954, President Eisenhower was taken to Edwards Air Force Base, and he met with people on a flying saucer, which had landed at Edwards Air Force Base, and that's when they made the first, uh, you might say, agreements uh, with uh, a particular uh, species. So now that you can say, well, is that 100% sure? It's not, but then you have some pretty accurate testimonies from people who are highly credible, including the Archbishop Cardinal of Los Angeles, who was taken there afterwards, because apparently the aliens left some craft to show that uh, they were, uh, that, you know, they had technology. And a few people, including some leaders of the church, some engineers, some scientists, were taken there to inspect this craft and just advise the government about what to do. So there is a more than, uh, you know, uh, just a wild story. But of course, it's not what you might consider part of the official ufology. Now, this is the book that uh, created, I would say, a revolution almost, because for the first time, a member of the US national security, uh, I mean, actually, uh, he had been uh, part of uh, US intelligence in uh, Europe during World War II. And then he was on the National Security Council, and uh, his name was Colonel Philip Corso, and when he was very old, uh, he wrote this book, which came out in 1997, in which he testified to what he knew about the Roswell incident, the recovery of the bodies and of the craft, and how they had been used by the um, Army, the Air Force, and the Navy, and also by the CIA, and how there had been big fights between the intelligence and the military communities about the technology control, because clearly there is no, uh, there is not much love lost between these various services, and they can be quite competitive, and sometimes they can undermine each other, and they certainly keep secrets from each other. Uh, there is a well-known case, the case of the ho so-called Hotel Memo. Hotel was an agent of the FBI, and he was tasked by uh, Edgar Hoover to find out what was happening with Roswell, because uh, Hoover knew almost nothing about it, so he said, I need to know, does the army, at that time there was no air force, it was only the army air force, and uh, what do they have? And then Hotel wrote this memo saying, yes, they found bodies, there were uh, people and there was one of them who was still alive, and the craft has been taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So that's part of a memo which has been authenticated. It is a real FBI memo. So clearly uh, there was a competition between people trying to understand what was going on, also between the Americans and the Soviets. Uh, Stalin was trying to find out what the Americans knew. The Americans were trying to find what the Soviets knew. And they both had a lot of information and a lot of technological uh, investigations going on. Now, uh, this was another very major, uh, this is, by the way, in the Washington Post. 
And this was a report on another uh, hearing which was held on capital, or it was held at the National Press Club, and this was in 2013. And uh, a number of witnesses, including military veterans, uh, Air Force pilots, uh, CIA agents, retired, uh, and uh, astronauts, all testified to what they knew and what they had seen. Now, uh, John Mack was the head of psychology at Harvard University. And uh, as eminent as he was, he realized that there was something happening with a number of people reporting being abducted and being uh, put under medical and surgical uh, experimentation in craft that essentially took them uh, up. And he found that these testimonies were many, and they were generally quite consistent, and they were quite believable. And because he was the head of uh, Harvard Psychology School, he had a certain immunity. People couldn't just claim he was a madman. But uh, he uh, obviously was not uh, followed unanimously by his peers. A lot of them felt this was really too far out. But he was very you know, persistent about it. I think he interviewed something like 280 witnesses, people who had actually been on spacecraft or who had interacted with aliens and who were put under uh, you know, various kinds of uh, uh, methods, including uh, particularly hypnosis, in order to do regression and remember what they had gone through. And unfortunately, John Mack was killed in a car accident when he went to England. Uh, he was not used to the British driving on the other side of the road, and he crossed the road at the wrong place and got hit by a car. Of course, many people said it was a conspiracy, but uh, I don't think so. I think it was a real accident. Now, I did meet Lawrence Rockefeller once, and uh, Lawrence Rockefeller was one of the five brothers, you know, he was uh, sort of black sheep of the family, and uh, he uh, was, got very interested in UFOs because they had evidence of it from their own place. You know, uh, the Rockefellers live in uh, upstate New York, in the Hudson Valley, and uh, they, the Hudson Valley was very often visited by this huge craft that went around as if uh, they didn't even try to hide. They were just floating there and uh, going at very low speed and then taking off. So he decided he had to do something about it. And uh, he started an initiative called the Rockefeller Initiative. Uh, he uh, hired his, I mean, he took his lawyer, Henry Diamond, to uh, first ask for the CIA, uh, ask the CIA to provide evidence. The CIA said, we don't know anything. Then he went all the way to President Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton and said, listen, you have to do something about this. And Clinton said, listen, I tried. I had my most confidential advisor uh, go to uh, the CIA and try to find out, and he was turned down. So I can't do anything about it because they won't tell me. And this is something that they say is not the president's business. Uh, so what do you want me to do? The Ro so Rockefeller invited them to his ranch in uh, uh, Wyoming. In fact, I have also been there, but not at the same time. And uh, he told them, this is what you have to do. This is my document. You have to provide some critical evidence that you know is there. And then you have to make a public statement. And that's when the Clinton said, listen, this could cost us the presidency and maybe our lives too. So uh, we are not going to do it. And that's why uh, basically uh, that evidence did not go any further than a conference which was called by Lawrence Rockefeller and which involved a lot of professionals from the field. That conference was held in Tarrytown, which is a place where the Rockefeller holds a lot of their uh, events. But again, uh, it was blocked, which means that even somebody like a Rockefeller cannot really get to the bottom of it. Now, I just provide this as an illustration of the some 600 uh, crop circles that have appeared. They are called crop circles, but they have incredibly complex shapes. And they have appeared in many parts of the world, but they appear at night and in a few split seconds. And in some cases, UFOs have been seen or photographed passing right over the fields where this uh, shapes are created. And first, they are huge. They can stretch as uh, far as, you know, 400 feet in diameter. And two, it's interesting that they choose fields in which the uh, cereals, I mean the grains, is grown to a certain level. And then they basically use an electromagnetic force to fold the grain in specific places and weave it as if it were some sort of a uh, textile. You see, so the grain is not harmed, it is not killed, it is not burnt, it is just woven in such patterns in order to create a difference in color. And this we have no 
proven explanation as to why they do it, it seems to be a message that they send either to some people here or to others. In other words, they may communicate among themselves by leaving these messages. It doesn't look like the most practical way of doing it. But, uh, you know, that's where our scientists have generally gone terribly wrong, sometimes on purpose, by saying, well, you know, why don't they send radio waves? Why can't we capture any message? You know, we were not hearing anything. Well, you know, when a civilization is a million years ahead of you, uh, they probably are not in need of radio waves, and you probably have no clue about what they are using, and it would be absurd if they somehow were pretty much at the same stage that we are at, you know. So the enormous mistake that has been made, probably on ideological and also religious grounds, is to assume that somehow we are at such a high level that anybody who is more uh, brighter than us is not really that much above us, you know, he must be about the same on the same level technologically and uh, mentally, so we should understand them. And they should come to us, visit the White House, and say, hello, uh, uh, earthly brothers, you know, we have come in peace. I mean, if you're dealing with an intelligence level which is as high uh, comparatively to ours as we are to an ant, for example, uh, or a bird, you certainly would not expect to be able to make sense of everything that happens there. So uh, that is just one of the images that shows us how complex they are in their manifestations. Now, as a last picture, uh, I want to show this, which is actually a very much a satellite image, which shows that uh, this UFO, which was photographed over Chile, uh, is, uh, m was measured to be 200 miles in diameter. Now, uh, it's not a unique case, because such huge craft have been photographed in outer space uh, near Jupiter, and near some of the inner planets. So we have to assume, and this has been uh, said by a number of quite credible people, that there are civilizations which have uh, gone uh, far, far above ours and which have created artificial planets on which they live. So when we try to say, where do you come from? Are you from that star or that planet? It could very well be that some of them have left planetary life a long time ago and are living on walls of their own, which uh, probably protect them from a number of uh, cataclysmic events that tend to happen on planets. And uh, that is something which has been so hard to gather for most of our uh, scientists that they have just preferred to ignore it. And that has been the attitude. Uh, it's, it's quite striking that some of the more scientifically minded people are actually quite put off by the whole thing and they don't even want to hear about it. They immediately assume there is something wrong with you or with whatever is being said. And therefore, it's like, we are a serious man, I'm not going to look into this. But yet, you know, we are dealing with a situation in which our scientific establishment is divided now into at least two tires. There is the average scientist who is doing his work in a university and who is probably very good at it. And then there are people who have been selected to do certain things which other people have no idea about and who work for the government, who work for the military industrial complex, and who are far, far ahead of uh, what we know. And now you have uh, quite a few uh, well-known scientists, or perhaps not so well-known, who tell you, actually, the physics that we still teach in schools is no longer valid. There are, of course, very valid elements in it, but we have gone far beyond it. And uh, it will take a long time, it will take a new scientific revolution, because a lot of what we're teaching our students, unless they go very deep, is probably not relevant in many cases. Uh, we have far over, you know, shot over this. And now we have to learn an entire new concept of the universe. In a way, I'm always reminded of that film, you know, uh, which uh, was very symbolic. And I, I think some of you may have seen it, um, it's, uh, it's a film in which a man lives in a world which is very familiar and pleasant and easygoing, and then he realizes that the whole thing is a theater play which has been staged for him, and he has to get over that uh, glass ceiling, get, and then he finds what the real world is outside. But what he is at is uh, the Truman Show. Thank you. So it shows you are somewhere listening attentively. So anyway, that's, uh, I think I wouldn't want to say more at this point because uh, I would like to say also as a uh, final note that uh, I, my father and I gave lectures on UFOs back in the 70s in the IITs and in some other in universities. And generally the response was quite positive. At that time, not so much was known neither about UFO nor about technology. I mean, we didn't know about artificial intelligence, about uh, 
uh, Internet of Things, about uh, you know, quantum computing. So I believe this is what is taking us to a level where we can understand better what the aliens are about. And probably that's what they were also waiting for, that uh, rather than interacting with people who were at a very primitive level, they would expect us to get to a point where at least some of the basic notions are now understood by at least some of us. I mean, take quantum computing, for example, and you see what it tells us. Take superconductivity, take cold fusion. All those things are what essentially brings us to a level where we can at least make sense of what the aliens are about. And uh, about, when was it, 12 years ago, uh, there was a commander of the US Navy, Commander Scott Jones. He came to India because he knew me, and he said, I want to come to India and try to expose some people to uh, what we know in the Navy. And he had been, as it turns out, he had been uh, naval attaché in the US Embassy under Ambassador Harry Barnes in, was in uh, New Delhi as a young man. And so he came back and he gave a talk at the IIC, it was at the Kamala Devi uh, uh, Auditorium, I mean wing, and uh, he spoke about, of course he had his own interpretation like many do, he said that according to the mili US military, those uh, beings had actually been the Anunnaki of the ancient Babylonians because they still spoke Sumerian. Now that's one version, but then there are others like uh, Daniel Sheehan, you know, who became very famous because he released the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s. And Daniel Sheehan, who was uh, counsel in general of the Jesuit Order of America, a very prominent position, he uh, was allowed to go into the Library of Congress and he was allowed to see some documents in a reserve section. And he said that what he saw there, the photographs, which were all from official sources, and the inscriptions that were on some of those crafts uh, reminded him of Sanskrit. He thought that there was some Sanskrit connection. Uh, and of course, that was something he said and he wrote. So it was a public statement. And he, again, is a very high credible witness. Um, Daniel Sheehan is still alive and is still very much participating in the UFO uh, situation in the sense that uh, he's mem he attends many conferences. And in many parts of the world, as you know now, there is one conference every week on UFO. So it has become a huge thing. And as I said, not only in the US. It, has, it is uh, in so many countries. Uh, but it's just that the US has uh, taken the, the cake, as it were, because probably because they made an agreement that not too many other countries have. And that's why there is a lot more interaction. And therefore, the presence is much heavier in the US. So I think I'll stop here. And uh, if there is time for a few questions, we can uh, end it there. Thank you. Can you have it possible, the previous uh, one, right? The one on the, the previous one. Should be, if I can get it to. OK, why isn't it going? All right. OK, this one? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Please. You know, this almost looks like a Add so, which is put here and there. Yeah, but you can see that about all the sides of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a mandala, actually. You know, they are incredibly complex shapes. Everyone is different, not two are alike. And they are very complex, and they are mathematical. They, they reflect mathematical algorithms. Well, dear friends, uh, uh, before we have the Q&A, most important part of the IAC program, we want to get an assurance from the IAC that uh, what you record will not be shared with the Pentagon. No. They know it all already. Thank you so much for bringing all of us together and taking us on this, uh, what shall I say, most interest, interesting and uh, certainly very intriguing voyage. Now, the floor is open. Uh, do mention your name. And uh, since there may be many questions, uh, make the questions as brief as possible. You were working somewhere in Mars and underground chambers on the moon. You want to enlighten us more about that? No, abductions, it, I, yeah. abductions take place, uh, have taken place many occasions, many, many occasions. There are some famous cases. But uh, the people they have taken to Mars are not, according to the testimony by Heshed and others, are not abducted. They are people who participate in a joint mission 
and uh, they have been selected. And uh, you know, the US, among others, has had a space uh, program for a long time and a military space program, which was not acknowledged. And uh, Trump finally made it official by saying there is a space force. Before that, there was only uh, a sort of a space command, but there was no dedicated space force, although we have evidence that the space force existed much before Trump made it public. But uh, in that case, we would, if uh, the testimonies are right, and these are things that we don't have physical proof of, then there are certain people who are working on a secret space program with uh, cooperation from other beings. And by the way, this has been said by people who didn't know each other from uh, NASA and uh, from uh, other departments. So, I mean, the Russians have said some very interesting things too. And uh, the KGB has said that they actually had people working for them who were not from this planet. This is part of a KGB document. And uh, President Medvedev, when he was president, gave that famous press conference when a reporter asked him, uh, what about UFOs? And he said, well, you know, we, when we uh, become president, we are given a list of people from other planets who are here on our territory so that we know where they are and we can monitor them. And he said it with a straight face. So the, the reporters thought it might be a practical joke, but actually he said it with a straight face. And it's not the first time the Russians have said these things, you know. So uh, clearly there is an involvement at a certain level. The question is interesting because it shows that the use of military uh, weaponry is probably in some ways controlled, you know, how you, far you can go. Uh, because clearly if there is that level of interaction, I would not expect the aliens or the others to allow anything to happen. And uh, that has been said in a number of messages from private witnesses who went public because they were not part of the government so they could speak. And they said, well, yeah, they told us, be careful, you cannot use nuclear weapons. This would be a madness, and you are, you are destroying your planet. This is a message that keeps coming. Now, you might say some people are inventing it, but so many people saying it shows there is probably some truth behind it. They are basically telling us, stay away from your current uh, technological and industrial uh, course, because you are essentially ruining your environment, which, you know, is true. Talk about the, the abductions, and you had also said that they. Would you kindly speak to the mic? Because uh, we are recording it. Oh, sorry. Please come and speak here. And mention your name so that you know. Uh, speak from here. Uh, my name is Sandhya Jain. It's regarding these abductions and uh, experiments that you talked about, genetic experiments. <coughs> about many years ago, I read a book which was written in the conspiracy theory style, but the basic thing is that the aliens need human blood to survive, and they're probably taking it only for that reason. And so the abductees who have come, uh, have consciousness data, and they talk about their abductions, do they report donating or being forced to give blood? Thanks. Uh, when, uh, after you ask the question, can you put up the mic? I've done that. Yeah, there is an issue, is an issue uh, that has been raised various times. Uh, for example, there are very credible testimonies that uh, when a particular craft was uh, fell down in Roswell, which is a very famous case, there are more than 20 sworn witnesses which, who were directly involved, uh, and they said that there were in the craft, there, was, there were body parts and there was uh, blood in certain containers or at least uh, serum, you know, what they call blood plasma. Now, that is likely true, uh, but we don't know for sure. And there are many other cases which are not at all related to this, which tells us that we have different species who probably have different agendas. It's possible that some of the beings who are created biological, you know, these cyborgs, uh, the gray ones in particular, they may need uh, hemoglobin, uh, for functioning, and uh, that's a possibility. But there seem to be very few cases actually involving uh, bleeding. Of course, Brazil has had its own set of very strange experiments. I mean, not experiments, but experiences in which uh, people were uh, either wounded or killed, and uh, the police, the army investigated. There was a great deal, because Brazil is one of the most open countries about this. They held an open Senate uh, investigation 
few years ago, and they have been investigating for long because, you know, there was a famous case, I think it was in 1978, where the Brazilian Air Force was spooked that there were a lot of very big craft being observed over the Amazon, and they were afraid that uh, there was an invasion. So they actually communicated with the U.S. Uh, government and said, what do we do? I mean, and the U.S. government said, well, listen, we, we can't really do much except help you investigate. And uh, it turns out that uh, that is very proven now because we have so many official investigations that in some cases where uh, craft fell, in Brazil in particular, but not only in Brazil, also in Peru, uh, the U.S. flew in, probably CIA teams, or, uh, you know, they have special forces, the so-called Black Berets, and they flew in, picked up the bodies, and whatever evidence they could, and flew back to the U.S. Uh, so clearly the investigation was being uh, not subcontracted, but it was in charge of the U.S. because the U.S. had uh, the most knowledge, at least in the West. And this has been made official even in France. You know, France had an official commission called COMETA, which was part of the French Center for Astrophysical Studies, Space Studies. And uh, it had a director, and it had several military people on its board. And then they came to conclusions. They published a report and said they are aliens. That was about seven, eight years ago. But then they said, you know, we can't go further because the US will have to decide what to do about it. We don't have the authority to even make an official statement. We can publish as a scientific agency, but we cannot make it an official government admission because the US have a control over it, which is probably held through NATO. So NATO is, in a way, the coordinating agency. Of course, the Russians are keeping their own counsel, and now we have a number of CIA telegrams showing that the CIA is trying to find out what the Chinese are doing about alien technology. Because it's mentioned in black and white that uh, the Chinese are investigating UFOs, and they seem to be making very quick progress. And you have seen how quickly the Chinese are advancing. So uh, there may be an element of that in their uh, scientific development program. Uh, no, where, in Roswell? No, anywhere. No, the, the sizes are generally small because they are like uh, boats. You know, they are not the main ships. They are the, the boats that are, the main ships stay in orbit. Uh, the, they send these smaller uh, craft. I mean, generally, on, on average, you are talking about uh, 30, 40 feet uh, in diameter. But what's very interesting, and this has been reported by, again, military people and others, that one, the size can change and the shape can change because they obviously have what they call pro programmable materials, which means that the material can be readjusted, recomposed uh, molecularly in order to change the size. And some people who went into the craft have testified that whether they were under a hallucination, because obviously you work on your mind, they actually change your perception, or whether it was true, the craft was much bigger inside than outside. So essentially, you, are, you see a 15 feet craft outside, but then you get in and you see it looks like it's 100 feet. Now, again, you cannot take these things 100%, but uh, it would make sense. You know, if you are dealing with that kind of uh, technology which combines uh, mind and matter, then they certainly can manipulate matter and manipulate the mind. And in fact, that's what uh, both the Americans and the Russians and others are trying to do with their uh, most advanced jets. They are moving to a point where the pilot will manipulate, will uh, pilot the jet with his mind, you know, and it will be essentially projected, it will be um, directly transmitted without going through uh, any other uh, material device. Uh, and that's uh, what apparently has been, uh, you know, said again and again, that if you try to get on a UFO and pilot it, it will not respond because there has to be a particular genetic signature and there has to be a mind coupling between the craft and the pilot. So it's not a technology that you can just take apart and say, okay, now I'm going to build one. You know, the Americans have been trying for 70 years and some results were achieved. But basically, the result is what you can see with the most advanced craft, you know, the, the most advanced uh, uh, jets. Thank you so much. And thank you for the follow-up questions. Over to you. Right. I wanted to ask you, why is it that these sightings are only in the... Sorry, Nilanjan Gupta. Why is it that these sightings are uh, mainly in the U.S. and Russia and in the West and not in, um, not in the Third World, not in India or, um, you know, close by Sri Lanka or Africa or somewhere there? Uh, 
No, no, they are in many countries. Uh, the Japanese, for example, have a report every year many encounters. All you have to, you go and go on the internet and go on New Fork, for example, in UFORC, which is a reporting agency, and they tell you about cases happening all over the world. Africa has had some very famous cases. Uh, so have every, almost all the South American countries. What's very interesting is that in Peru, in Nazca, they have found uh, mummies which are actually visible among the mummies that our friend Gary Nolan was actually uh, analyzing, I mean, in terms of forensics. And some of these mummies are not human. So they were apparently mummified hundreds of thousands of years ago in the Atacama Desert. And so uh, there is a very old phenomenon, but they are definitely happening everywhere. You know, one of the most famous and uh, striking cases, they made a film about it, was in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, where about 60 school children uh, saw a craft landing and they saw two beings come out and all the children were in a way in a state of panic but at the same time they also felt an enormous amount of uh, I would say sympathy. There, there was a sense that these beings were not harmful and that they knew everything and they basically captured you. You know, the moment you look into their eyes you know they have these huge black eyes and it seems that they know everything about you and yet you don't feel threatened except you feel totally shocked because it's so di different. Now, what's interesting is that the 60 students, they were white, black, Indian, they all pretty much said the same thing. They all had seen it. They were interrogated separately by a number of police and other authorities, psychologists. And they never went back on what they had seen. Some of the teachers had seen it too. And this happened about 25 years ago. And not uh, more than two years ago, they got these children back together. Now they are grown people. And they all remembered it completely as they had seen it before, and they said it was the greatest experience in our lives, and we could never forget it, because it suddenly gave us a completely different perspective on our beings and on life, you know. And you can't expect 60 children to stick to the same story and have this experience, which was really traumatic in a way, but which was also incredibly uplifting. So uh, you have to see that these phenomena take place pretty much everywhere. What's happening with the US, however, is that they made some agreements, and that's why there is an intense presence. And uh, by the way, that's one of the problems, because now they can hardly tell people, yeah, we did it, and we didn't tell you, because and we spent trillions of dollars, and we have done all sorts of experiments, and we are a democracy. But guess what? In that case, we decided democracy was not in order. So we just did what we thought we had to do. And that's a huge problem. I think that the U.S. is going to be very severely affected because now the cat is out of the bag. And uh, one more addition to that, Eric von Daniken did a lot of research on this and he wrote a book called According to the Evidence in the 70s and 80s. So um, where he clearly proves that all the ancient civilizations mm -hmm. had, they were actually built by alien civilizations. So do you, do you think there's a truth in this? And what is the connection with India and the Indian temples, a lot of which has seemed to have alien spacecraft designs? Yeah, I mean, Eric von Daniken uh, was very popular, and he probably got read by a lot more people than uh, any uh, more scientific UFO book, because he was a great uh, salesman, and he was a... But, of course, you can never prove, you know, what happened 5,000 years ago. You can say, well, this monument is so incredible that it probably wasn't built by human beings. But, of course, that in itself is speculation. And, of course, if you tell that to the Egyptians, they get very upset because they say, what do you mean? We were not capable of building the pyramids. You are disputing our greatness. So you have to be very careful, very diplomatic about these things. But um, inevitably, I mean, once you see the evidence to be so strong today that you have to assume that this could have happened in the past too, and there is no reason to deny the possibility. Uh, I mean, I have lectured often about the manas and the Vaimanika Shastras and all that, and it seems that there were beings in ancient India who were participating in some of the going-ons. You know, they sometimes intervene in battles and they visited human beings. I mean, think of Narad Muni, who flew back, flew down from his uh, heavenly home and uh, went around uh, explaining, you know, giving wisdom to the kings. And uh, you could say very well see him as a being from another planet. In fact, there is in the Mahabharata, in the Shanti Parva, they tell you that Narad Muni's main job is to keep the Devas and Asuras fighting because by fighting, they leave the humans alone. 
So that's an interesting hint that maybe uh, as long as these beings are having their own problems, then they may not bother us too much, as some of them might, you know, if they wanted to. But what about the connection with yeah. the Indian temple spaceship design? Oh, that's of course, the Vimana is supposed to be modeled on a spacecraft. I mean, that's one of the etymologies, you know, so it could very well be because you have the Garbhagriha, which seems to be the being sitting in the Vimana. Yeah, so. Uh, one second, uh, we have uh, someone who was asked earlier, and then here, and there, and then here. Uh, so, just a follow up question to the previous question. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, the pre uh, you know, uh, like the vehicles and the vimanas had Sanskrit inscriptions and all. So, why didn't the previous generation leave some evidence for the future generations like us? We have left uh, Voyager spacecraft with golden records. Uh, we have uh, somewhat a conspiracy theory of the dark night satellite in our orbit. So why didn't the previous uh, civilizations leave somewhat evidence of satellite in geostationary orbits or some kind of spacecraft for the future genera generations for the reference? Like we are starting, restarting the whole research now from the 18th century, 19th century. Why aren't we able to follow up the, those research which we had done in the previous civilizations? We'd have to ask them. I mean, we don't know. I mean, uh, you but know, there are yeah. many things that we cannot explain, but uh, it's not a given that they didn't leave any traces. They may, leave, uh, they may have left traces that we have not been able to interpret until now. And these traces may be very different from what we are now doing, because they may have op operated in a very, very different way. Some will tell you that some of the great monuments of the past, like the pyramids, contain certain messages I mean, a lot of people have been working on it. Even the CIA has been working on it. You know, they had a, a program which was meant to interpret the secrets of the ancient Egyptians. It's called Stargate. Hmm. And they were trying to get into another dimension and another uh, time frame uh, by following certain uh, mathematical secrets uh, that the Egyptians seem to have embedded in the pyramids. Whether that is true or not is up to you. You know, people have to do their own research. And until we get to a final proof, we can keep an open mind. But civilizations can operate in very, very, very different ways, and especially if they come from a different you know, uh, environment. For example, we are a carbon-based uh, civilization. What if they are a silicon-based uh, species? Uh, what if they, you know, there are all sorts of possible combinations which would make uh, us so different that we could only communicate in certain very specific ways, and the rest of their uh, mental universe would be extremely hard for us to, go, to, to get into. Okay. Thank you. Please. Uh, there, there. I'm sorry. Yeah. My name is George. I'm a scientist, a biotechnologist. Let me say that I'm a bit skeptic about the whole thing, and I would volunteer to be abducted to, be <laughs> <laughs> to see, really see if this is really happening. I'm aware of Eric Danikan's book. There are a lot of controversies also about some of these findings. So I really don't know whether we have the final word on this whole thing. Well, you see, Danikan, uh, as I tell my Indian friends, because most of them are more aware of Danikan than of what's happening today. And I tell them, Danikan is a very good thing to read, and it's entertaining and fun, and it's a mystery uh, book, but you don't have to believe what Danikan says. Just look at the evidence which is now uh, being openly uh, discussed in the Senate with the sworn testimonies and uh, in, inclu including, you know, for example, the former uh, Deputy Secretary of uh, Defense, uh, Christopher Mellon, who has come out saying, we know we have extraterrestrial beings visiting us, we have been hiding it, I think this is no longer tenable, we have to stop it and reveal it to the public. And interestingly enough, when the people from Congress, senators and congressmen, were asked, do you believe what David Grush said about aliens being held by the U.S. Uh, military intelligence community, they said, we believe him. One, he's highly credible. Two, he's not alone. And three, this is matching what we were shown by the CIA and the, and the military in our closed door hearings. So we can't tell you what we saw because we are under the seal of secrecy, but it matches what he said. So you have multiple testimonies, plus you have technological evidence coming from many countries. So there is a point when skepticism becomes a matter of ideology, where, you know, I don't believe it because I don't like it, and somehow I prefer to believe that we are the best and the only ones in the universe. And there are many people who tell you that. There are people who, because of their religion, will say, no, I don't think that's possible because the Bible doesn't quite say so and all that. But then you are getting into a different thing. You are not talking science anymore. You are talking about your prejudice, about what you, how you think the universe works, you know. Thank you. Please.
that we will never be able to reach a full understanding because it's far beyond us. The other one is more optimistic, saying that actually these people are us in the future. This was said by a number of military people in the, in the US and also in Russia. And of course, you have to ask them, why do you think so? They said, because it looks like they are essentially coming from another space time. They are not just traveling in space, they are traveling in space time. So they may be coming from a period which is actually ahead of us. And they are probably trying to guide us in the way that uh, they would like us to go because in a way that uh, uh, they are the result of something that we are a part of the process. That's a fascinating view. Of course, it's metaphysical in a way, uh, but it's, it's interesting that a number of scientists are considering this because they don't see any other option uh, than assuming that there is a bridge which is being created and which will probably be mediated by artificial intelligence and quantum computing, among other things which will enable us to um, get out of the linear thinking, you know, and to essentially have uh, what is becoming what we call holistic. Uh, I mean, there were a number of people who worked on this, like John von Neumann and others. And uh, clearly, a lot of our prejudices and a lot of our ways of operating are completely silly. I'm not saying that uh, others are necessarily doing better in every way, but, you know, when you think of why we fight wars, or why, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Basically, we fight wars because there are people who want to sell weapons and others who think they'll uh, get more girlfriends if they come back as victorious warriors. Or <laughs> but, you know, there is absolutely no reason to fight a war that you could not avoid, right? And yet we keep doing it continuously. So uh, when we are stopped somewhere, it starts somewhere else. So uh, all these things show that we are stuck in a particular uh, mental universe and, uh, you know, many scientists and people who are not scientists but who are influential, like Elon Musk, said we are living in a virtual reality. You know, reality is not, I mean, think of uh, the films that have been made about it. You know, we are living in a dream. That's Maya, that's Maya Samsara. But the dream is being projected by someone else. And we get caught in it and we are all thinking that we are doing amazingly well because we got a lot of money or, you know, we, we have success in, in the world. But yet, if it's all a dream, and uh, at some point you'd realize that this is just, you know, in the end you die and everything dis dissipates. So, I mean, th these are the things that I believe all life is one, because clearly the universe is alive. Now we know that even in outer space there are uh, elementary forms of life, and I'm sure there are many more, but at least what we are able to prove now because of some, you know, uh, space stations that have been orbiting for a long time, now we see that there are uh, growth that are coming. It's a form of interstellar lichen or uh, moss. So it means that life is everywhere and the universe itself is a living being. Therefore, uh, when you understand life is everywhere, you no longer are stupefied. Why are they? How could they be there? I mean, we are here. They are there. You know, it's full of life. We cannot have trillions of uh, galaxies 
So nothing, I mean, nothing grows, you know, it's impossible. And in fact, the new telescope, I mean, James Webb, what it's showing us is a universe which is becoming substantially different from what we knew even a few years ago. So a lot of our theories have to be revised, and therefore to claim that, you know, we know so much that we can't admit certain things because they don't match with our knowledge, that in itself is a fallacy. But to answer your question, I assume I'd rather think that there is that ability to communicate which arises from a certain level, and that is what the UFO presence is about. You cannot think that it's completely meaningless. On the one hand, they may be indifferent to our individual fates. You know, we are not very care concerned about what happens to frogs, although now we're beginning to, to mind. But uh, on the other hand, we realize that life is one and we have to preserve the ecosystem. And likewise, they probably are telling us too that you have to become part of the ecosystem in a way that is respectful of other life forms. And you have to really understand the, the, the game. And right now, you don't really understand it. You know, but you are beginning to, and you could. And that's another very interesting thing which was said by a number of very credible witnesses. They said, you know, one of the messages that came very powerfully from them is, you don't know how powerful you, humans, are. If you develop your real abilities, you could be as powerful as us, and you could be you could be far more powerful than you ever imagined you could be. It's just that you are stuck in a particular stage of evolution where you are going in circles, and at least mentally speaking, so that you are always thinking of the same thing. How can I build more weapons to kill the other fellows so that I can get what they have and they don't kill me? You know that. Huh? Bonjour, monsieur. Uh, I apologies, I missed the earlier part of your lecture. Uh, I wish I had attended it. And my name is Kadambri Batra, a member here at IIC, but um, from the UK. So I split my time between London and India and get a good perspective on both cultures, so to speak. Um, so many things that you've said, uh, so interesting, and, and yet, as this gentleman was saying, uh, perhaps some of these are in conflict with each other. Uh, many questions. One that comes to mind, how is the sort of the whole discussion on the UFOs, uh, whether you're talking about, you know, another species or an intelligence traveling from another space-time tangent into ours. How does that reconcile with, say, the simulation theory? You touched on that. You know, this is just um, AI, a very, very nascent form of AI that we are living in. But it's very real to us, obviously. Um, how, do, how do those two concepts sort of reconcile? Um, and also, I suppose, uh, you mentioned the James Webb uh, telescope and, you know, the Big Bang Theory obviously is not the Big Bang Theory anymore, so you, you just touched on that. Um, so how much more is there to learn, you know, another great telescope or another technology will come in the future and that will change our understanding even more. And so I guess the second part of it is, if the, I'm sure there's intelligence which is far ahead of us, why would they be interested in learning about an intelligence that's still like little babies or little, you know, is still learning. It's so much to develop. Maybe we are in nursery and they are just watching us grow. Mm -hmm. That's one of the theories that has been presented. Um, you know, if you think of the relativity of life, then there is no unimportant thing. You know, if you get involved in studying insects, you realize how powerful and how uh, wise and inventive they are, and you become absolutely fascinated. Just the other day I was watching a spider, a minuscule spider, it had built a web, and it had basically bridged about 20 feet between two trees, and it had created its uh, cobweb in the middle, and the whole thing was incredibly subtle and incredibly strong, and it was all about catching some insects, and you say, how, you know, it's like we alone would build a trap that would be uh, a mile long, you know, and we'd be doing that every day, you know, to, to catch, to, to be, be able to get food. So you can see uh, how much intelligence pervades life, and therefore any creature which has reached that level of evolution would probably not despise us, at least as a species. They would simply be trying to bring us forward. And of course, you mentioned one theory, but I'll mention another, which is also quite uh, a matter of discussion, which is the intervention theory, which means that human beings are actually modified uh, primates, and that there was a genetic 
uh, impulsion that was given in order to bring us to the level there where we are, you know, where we can get into abstraction and we can start planning ahead and we have all sorts of things that animals don't have, however intelligent they may be. Uh, simply because animals satisfy their needs. And once they satisfy their needs, they just perpetuate and carry on. Whereas we always look beyond and try to build something new, which is getting us into a lot of trouble, but we still do. And uh, so that is something which probably could have been inseminated in us. And some of the recent research would show that human beings are still being modified continuously and probably in order to acquire new capabilities, such as, for example, handling artificial intelligence, you know, which might not have been possible or quantum computing. That might not have been possible before because there was not a critical mass sufficient to absorb and develop and function within these. Uh, of course, now you get into singularity, right? And Kurzweil tells you soon the machines will beat us and we won't be able to control them because they decide they are going to kill us because we are just uh, dangerous for them. You know. Thank you. The last question. We should so, coming back to the people you said you were working on Mars, how do these Martians or whatever, how do they survive in terms of water and oxygen and things like that? Because I'm a doctor, I can't help go down that direction. And the second issue was, you are talking about communication. We only have five senses. There might be many other senses which we are not aware of. So we can't communicate, we can only hear, see, but people in other planets have other dimensions of communication, telepathic and other. Even and we don't even have the sensory organs to be able to connect. Even among us, there are people who have senses that others don't have. You see, they have tested that there are people who are blind, but they can see through yes. their uh, yes. fingers. You know, not without touching, just by putting the fingers within a short distance from an object, they can actually get an image. So you see, the body has many ways of compensating, just like the brain can regenerate itself. If half of the brain goes because of an accident, the other part will take over and restore a certain... But back to what you were saying, you see, for a level of civilization that we are talking about, finding water and all the things you need is not a problem. Mars had water, it still has frozen water, and you know that some years ago, it was discovered that there were microorganisms on Mars. This is now acknowledged, but it was hidden. Why? Same thing. If you acknowledge there is life anywhere, then you open the Pandora's box. Because they all go, then if there is that kind of life, then there could be other kinds of life. And uh, particularly the US, they got stuck in this stupid thing of saying, no, there is no life, there can't be any life. And we are looking for it, but it doesn't happen yet, you know. And now gradually they are inching, saying, well, you know, there may be life on this planet, and there probably is water on this planet, but it will take some years to go there and find out, you know. Uh, my name is Shaquille Ahmed. Uh, you talked about some activities uh, uh, were noticed in Siachin and some other areas, and it was brought to the notice of uh, then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh who didn't take uh, much notice of it because of nuclear deal was uh, under negotiation. Now, was that one-time activity or it kept on happening later also? That is number one. Number two, was it brought to the notice of the current Prime Minister also or not? Well, uh, there was definitely a recurrent activity and I believe it's still going on. And uh, it's well known, there was a very thick file that was brought to the Prime Minister at that time, Dr. Manmohan Singh. And as, you, as I said, it was decided that no further public investigation was done about it. Now, it's interesting that I have a French and a, an American investigator I'm in touch with who both said India has a secret UFO-related research program. But they have been very quiet about it. And I said, well, I obviously haven't come across it, and if it's secret, it's secret. Um, maybe Indians are better at keeping certain secrets than others, but uh, I would be surprised if nothing had happened. I know that the government, uh, at certain levels, some people in the government know about it, and as you know, the usual uh, Indian cultural response is, we should uh, know about it because all our uh, Shastras and our Itihasas uh, talk about it, you know. I mean, if you think of the, the Samarangana Sutradhara and, you know, all those uh, the stories of Vikramaditya and it's all about those robots and beings from outside. So there is a tradition. Therefore, it doesn't seem as shocking 
as it does to some Western cultures, which have become too indoctrinated with the myth of scientific omniscience, so that they feel, hey, if we don't know about it, it can't exist because, you know, Newton said this and Einstein said this, therefore, you know, and then in the end, you just realize these are all benchmarks. You're just, somebody will say something else and everything will change, you know, once you prove it or once you have to admit it. Thank you so much. Uh, even the IAC cannot control the passage of time. <laughs> and maybe the aliens can, but we are not. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been extremely interesting. And, uh, you know, I said earlier that here is a polymath. Now, that has been proved beyond any doubt. So let's give a big applause. And an applause to this interactive audience. And I want to make an announcement. You know, if uh, we are getting this uh, UFOs, it might mean that uh, the universe is bio-friendly. Not only in this small corner called the Earth, but elsewhere too. Now on the 22nd of August, we have a program on the origin of time, a book written by Thomas Hertog, who was a junior colleague of uh, Stephen Hawking. Thomas did his PhD under Stephen, and this book is called The Origin of Time, The Final Theory of Stephen Hawking. So that is on the 22nd in this hall, same time, and to discuss the book, we have a professor of philosophy from Stephens and also a professor of physics from Stephens. We have not been able to get hold of Herthog because he is in London. <laughs> but uh, since you are so much, uh, what shall I say, curiosity driven, I took the liberty of announcing it and thank you once again. Thank you. Out up and out earlier. <laughs> and now I would have started saying, wind up, wind up. No, it's early, it's 